wonderful way to kick off the, the Words Festival. That was just such a, a stunning, stunning overview of, uh, uh, of the work. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everybody in this room on behalf of the organizing committee for the Words uh, Literary Festival. We are honored, and I mean truly honored, to have every single one of you present uh, for this chock-a-block weekend of readings, interviews, talks, performances, open mic poetry, a local author's book fair with 40 participating local authors, and much, much more. Words offers a unique opportunity to focus our collective attention on the creative hubs of our community, while also foregrounding the works and creative ideas of our most creative writers, thinkers, and artists. We have an exciting lineup of guests this weekend here at Museum London, and we want to give you a chance tonight at our opening reception to meet four of our feature authors, Robert Chafe, Mariko Tamaki, Jennifer Robson, and George Elliott Clark. But before I welcome them up to the stage, I want to give you some remarks about what to expect when you come back Saturday and Sunday to the museum to see the festival. I'd like to suggest, to begin, that words is part of something much larger, larger that's afoot right now in the London community. Back in June, I had the chance to attend the Urban League of London. Uh, they hold something called Pints in Politics. Many of you might know it, many of you might attend it. You should if you don't. Uh, the event was known as the Arts in London, and it was co-hosted by our new Poet Laureate here in London, Tom Call. And he was before he was the Poet Laureate, now the Poet Laureate. As the subtitle for the event, they had three words. Dying, surviving, thriving. Each followed by a question mark to provoke the group to select the appropriate descriptor. What followed was a lively discussion amongst citizens, artists, arts leaders. Dying? How could that be in Sewesto, the place of Greg Curnow and James Rainey, the region of Robertson Davies, John Kenneth Galbraith, Oscar winner Paul Haggis, Nobel Prize winning author Alice Munro, or current Giller nominee Emma Donahue, who you can see this weekend at Words. So how about surviving? What about our vibrant literary scene with well-attended meetings of Poetry London at Landon Library, or open mic poetry at Mykonos Restaurant, or the London Poetry Slam, who just took second prize at the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word this past week, their best finish ever. It's pretty good. So then what about thriving? Is that the word we should use? In the heat of the discussion, Deanna Tamblin, one of our finest cartoonists and the creator of the organizer of the Ting Comic and Creative Arts Festival, yes, you should applaud Deanna, her work in the city. Deanna said something that really resonated with me. And what she said was, and I hope Deanna doesn't mind me saying so because she's heard me say this before repeating her, she noted that London seems to be undergoing a renaissance in the arts. In very recent years, London has seen the birth of not one, but two Comic-Cons. We have the Forest City Film Festival that's taking place next weekend, and Janice will be a part of that Forest City Film Festival as an artist. The higher education institutions are more embedded in the city right now than they've ever been, both Western and Fanshawe, who are both partners on this festival. Theater of all kinds, independent theater, is booming. Tomorrow, you'll have a chance to meet the new artistic director of the Grand Theater, Dennis Garnham. The visual arts are vibrant, as the exhibition London Collects testifies to here at Museum London. And as you flow through the museum space this weekend, make sure you go see London Collects. I'm only scratching the surface here of my very brief survey, but the London literary and creative arts are humming. They're buzzing with activity right now. We have challenges, there's no doubt but we have a lot to celebrate, and that is what this weekend in London, Ontario is about. The celebration of our achievements and a look ahead and a look back at what we've done. What I found most encouraging about that Pints and Politics meeting was the fact that it was one of those, those moments where you saw dialogue taking place in a participatory and energetic exchange of ideas that was happening in that room. And I've seen more and more of that happening recently. 
If we are indeed on the verge, or even in the midst, of a resurgence of energy, as we have seen and we have good reason to, to think, I would look to the renewed ethos of collaboration and participation that's animating the cultural life of this city, across the artistic disciplines and with intergenerational participants. Words Festival is the public manifestation of this collaboration, motivated by the belief that all Londoners of all ages and all backgrounds should have an annual forum to encounter new ideas and artistic forums. That's what we're trying to do with the Words Festival. The London Public Library is hosting the local book fair for around 40 art artists on Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 4, so you should check that out. Western and Fanshawe students will be present as volunteers throughout the weekend. Our interviewers and moderators are drawn from the city, whether it's from Western, whether it's from Fanshawe, whether it's from the media outlets in the city, all over the map. Our three major poetry groups are coming together to bring you open mic poetry night tomorrow night on Saturday. We've called it Poetry Live, where all can read their own work hosted by our new poet laureate, Tom Call, and the director of Poetry Slam, Holly Painter. Poetry London, Insomniac Press, and a group of our student editors will bring you the Words Fest zine, an instant publication that will emerge on Sunday filled with contributions from you, our guests, our participants, when it's revealed overnight to be published here at the festival. You can become a published author overnight. And of course, Insomniac Press is appropriately named to be doing that project. We hope you will submit something. We had Penn Kemp submit something, and it was uh, uh, put into the London Free Press by Joe Belanger. So you can check out what something like that looks like. But now, I'd like to introduce four speakers that can give us a sense of what to expect over the course of the weekend here for the Words Festival. And I'm going to keep my biography shorter, but I'm also going to read a little bit so I can allow them to emerge to the stage. As I read your name, you can probably come up and join us here. So Robert Chafe. Robert Chafe is a playwright based in St. John's, Newfoundland. He is the author of 17 stage scripts and co-author of another eight. He frequently collaborates with director Gillian Kiley, who's the current artistic director of English theatre at Canada's prestigious National Arts Centre. She was a guest here, actually, just this past spring. He was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award for Drama, for Tempting Providence, and Butler's Marsh in 2004, and won the award for After Image in 2010. Tempting Providence is entering its 13th year of Canadian and international touring. Robert is the artistic director and playwright for Artistic Fraud Newfoundland. You can see him tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., mark that on all of your phones and calendars, uh, in conversation with George Elliott Clark and our new Grand Theatre Artistic Director, Dennis Garnham. So that's something definitely to see. Jennifer Robson, a graduate of King's <laughs> University College, is a best-selling author of novels Somewhere in France, After the War is Over, and Moonlight Over Paris. She holds a doctorate in British Economic and Social History from St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. After spending time in publishing and freelance editing, she took the plunge to realize her dream to write. In January of this year, and get this, in January of this year, she had three novels, her entire Great War trilogy, on the Globe and Mail's Canadian fiction bestseller list, all at once. <laughs> Never done by an author before. Her next novel, Every Time We Say Goodbye, will be published in 2017. You can see Jennifer tomorrow in conversation with Emeritus Professor of History at King's, Paul Webb, who was in fact one of her professors when she was an undergraduate student here in London, Ontario. So that will be fantastic to see. Mariko Tamaki. Mariko Tamaki is an award-winning artist and writer across a range of genres, including theater, fiction, and nonfiction, as well as graphic novels, to capture only a snapshot of her work. She has garnered much acclaim for both her written and performance-based work. Her graphic novel, Skim, created with her cousin, Gillian Tamaki, was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award and received numerous accolades, including the Doug Wright Award for Best Graphic Novel, the Ignatz Award, and the Joe Schuster Award. Those are heavy-hitting awards. 
She teamed up with her cousin Jillian again to produce an award-winning novel this one summer. And just this past year, it's announced that she'd be writing the new Hulk series starring Jennifer Walters for Marvel Comics and the miniseries Supergirl for DC Comics. She recently published her young adult book, Saving Montgomery's Soul. You can see Mariko on Sunday at 3 p.m. with graphic novelist Tava Harrison and London's own cartoonist Deanna Tamblin. And finally, George Eliot Clark. George Eliot Clark is a Canadian poet, playwright, and academic amongst his many creative hats. He is currently serving as the Parliamentary Poet Laureate of Canada, previously held Toronto's Poet Laureate. He also holds the E.J. Pratt Professor of Canadian Literature at the University of Toronto as an expert on African-Canadian and African-American history and culture, especially that of the Maritimes. He has been a passionate champion of African-Canadian writers and writing. He has a list of awards that is extensive. I'll only name the Governor General's Award for Poetry, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Achievement Award, Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Fellowship, and appointments to the orders of Nova Scotia and Canada. And oh yeah, he has eight honorary doctorates. He is the author of many books, including his newest novel, The Motorcyclist, and his book of poems titled Gold. You can see George tomorrow in conversation with Robert and Dennis Garnham. Please welcome George to the stage. Okay. So to get started, I'd like to start off with a question to ask all of you, uh, and it dovetails with my opening remarks about collaboration, a concept that we don't always associate with the artist. We sometimes have the image, maybe it's an inheritance of romanticism, of the isolated genius toiling away to bring their precarious productions to the public. But each of you has had a very uniquely collaborative approach to your work, and perhaps I could start uh, with, with Robert on this particular question. Um, Artistic Fraud is recently celebrating its 20th anniversary, and I know you've been working with Gillian Kiley for many, many years, and I wonder if we could start off by talking about that, that role of collaboration that animates Artistic Fraud, and what it's been like to, to work with Gillian as well as the other staff at Artistic Fraud. Sure. This is on, yes. Um, so an interesting fact about myself and Gillian Kiley, we, we grew up in the same small town just south of St. John's called the Goulds, Newfoundland. Uh, but we didn't meet. Uh, our parents were friends, our brothers played hockey together. We didn't meet until I was 21 because she was Catholic and I was Anglican. And there was a separate school system, so I had to get on a bus every day and go 45 minutes out to St. John's to go to school. Uh, so uh, when I started as an artist, and I was in, at Mon and I was at Moore University doing uh, work there, People would always ask me, do you know this woman, Gillian Kiley? Well, I don't know who you're talking about. And she was, turns out, getting the same question about me. When we did uh, eventually uh, connect, it kind of started this um, collaboration that's still going today. You know, Jill took on um, the artistic directorship of English Theatre at National Arts Centre five years ago. And one of her... Um, main things that she talked about in her job interview and she talked about uh, with the staff of the NAC was her determination to keep our little company going, which is kind of crazy because our little company doesn't have the funds to pay her uh, like some of these larger theaters that are, are, are employing her now. But she really wanted to keep that going in part, I think, because of me, but in part because I think that that's where she gets the most freedom to, to do what she wants to do. And I can say that's the case about our collaboration. Um, theater is a strange form anyway. You know, I'm, I, I teach um, emerging playwrights all the time, and, and one of the, the main things that I try to impart to them as they kind of cross disciplines from, from fiction to poetry is that uh, the, the idea of, of uh, playwriting as a form of writing and how many, how many personalities it has to go through, how many hands touch it before an audience encounter it. So few people actually encounter the playwright's art through the written word. Uh, most people encounter it on stage, and by that point, it's gone through so many artist visions. And um, so I've been very, very lucky to have those those people. I mean, I, I do want to take the opportunity. I know we're short on time. I do want to take the opportunity to kind of... I was talking about this woman earlier tonight, and I feel like I have to mention her, because one of my, my greatest collaborators just passed away. And I, every opportunity that I, I, I kind of get to talk publicly now, I, I'd like to talk about her. Her name was Iris Turcott. She was actually from London. Uh, she was raised in London. Um, but she was a, a Toronto dramaturg that... Uh, you know, there's hardly any work done in Canada, I think, over the last 25 years that she didn't touch. Uh, she used to take playwrights under her wing, and she certainly took me under her wing about 10 years ago. Um, 
And so even the solitary act of, of writing plays for me was, was sparked by collaboration from the very beginning, as I was saying to this lovely table tonight. Uh, my, my plays over the last 10 years have always started uh, with myself and Iris in a room screaming at each other and bashing ideas out. Um, so, yeah, I think I answered your question. That's beautiful, beautiful response and a wonderful dovetail to Jennifer. We do assume with novelists, and it depends on the novelist, of course, that it's a solitary act of creation, but you're very, uh, very outspoken about the place that your father played in the developing of your of your work as a, as an eminent historian, but also your sister, who was very supportive to you in terms of throwing drafts before you'd even publish your first <laughs> novel. And you also speak about the fact that you work with your agent and your publisher as people who are almost like co-creators in the way that your process yeah. works. Could you speak to that well, larger frame? But it can be. I think all the writers here tonight would agree it can be a lonely existence at times, uh, more than your. Your, your study or your room or wherever you're hiding away. Um, sometimes I show up at little cafes in the neighborhood because I just can't stand to be on my own. Or, or more likely, I, I just, you know, I, I have to have a walk to, to get the ideas going. Um, but it all comes, it's, it's solitary at times, but it's also profoundly collaborative. And I've always felt that I, 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 I owe a debt to the people who, who, I, I'm doing the writing, but in terms of the shaping the narrative as it comes together, uh, that's something that I do. Uh, you know, I'm definitely not alone. Um, I, I work very closely with my editor at William Morrow in, in New York um, and with my wonderful literary agent. I know, you know, it, it sounds like you're standing at the Oscars or something thanking your lawyer <laughs> and so on. But these are people who, who play a profound role in your life and you, you feel very, very close to them, so much so that when my, I lost my editor recently, I mean, she's, she's fine, she moved to another publisher. <laughs> Damn you, Penguin Random House. Um, and uh, I have a new editor who's wonderful, but I feel as if there's this, this I, I, I felt um, uh, motherless for the first few days, notwithstanding the fact that she's 15 years younger than I am. And adrift, and uh, you know, and, and my husband, the civil engineer, occur, uh, accused me of being a, a delicate artist, and to, to, to get over it, I did. But uh, you know, it's 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 going to take, I think, a few years before I feel that that ease with my new editor, as wonderful as she is, uh, to be able to to throw out ideas without the fear of sounding goofy, um, and to be able to accept criticism and and uh, um, and to kind of digest it without having the vapors. Um, and you know, and, and but that's a role too. You play with with friends who are writers. We're passing back and forth drafts to one another. Um, and you know, the person who first reads my books, in addition to my editor and my literary agent, is my sister um, because she she loves to read. Uh, she's a she's she's the person who probably reads more than I do, scarily enough these days, because I'm busy writing half the time and. Um, and, and if, she, if she gets, we, I call it the sniff test, and if something I've written doesn't pass the sniff test then with my sister, then it comes out of the book. Um, it, but it, it's, it, so it's, it's something on the surface that seems lonely, but in fact, it, you, you can't write a book or poetry or plays by yourself. You, you would, it, they would be very, I would think they would be very hollow creations. Wonderful. Um, Mariko, I know you get this question all the time. Working about your, with your with your cousin uh, Jillian, uh, and of course your work with Jillian. We want to hear about that. But I also want to point to the fact that you, uh, when you were in Montreal, were always embedded in groups, and you the way that you've created, you always cite your friends as well as your family as being absolutely embedded in your creativity as almost a, a, a cauldron for the kind of activity that you do. And I was wondering if you could speak to that 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 group atmosphere that comes uh, to produce your art. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a lesbian, so I'm a natural collaborator. Like, it's, I was born to be a collaborator. Um, but, I mean, and truthfully, like, I did grow up in, I started off as um, the, my sort of, my original art form, uh, which is the most amazing art form, which is, of course, lesbian spoken word, uh, which is where I started. So much respect to the lesbian spoken word artists in the room. Um, but then I moved on really quickly to performance art, and I was involved in troops like Pretty Porky and Pissed Off, uh, and um, TOA, which was Theater of Assholes. Uh, some <laughs> very prestigious background in the theater. <laughs> um, 
But I, I mean, the thing that I really learned from that, like from working with the collective, was that unless everybody in the room agreed, you would not move forward. Like if you couldn't agree on what you were wearing or what the song was, then everything sort of ground to a halt. And when I eventually moved on into theater and doing sort of more plays, I really gained an appreciation for this idea of like the sum of its parts, like that there's, you know, there is, it's an incredible thing to be part of an artistic process that produces something that's bigger than you are. And I think that that naturally led me to comics. Like I was really excited to work in comics when I first got the opportunity, not just because I would get to work with Jillian, because I think she's an incredible artist, but because I knew that whatever we made together was going to be sort of something that I could never do by myself, which I was so into. And uh, I mean, it makes you kind of like it's, I'm going to use the wrong word, but it's kind of like, think of a nice word for like slutty, that I just really like the idea of finding somebody that I'm going to be able to, this is, <laughs> this is getting worse as I'm saying more. <laughs> um, but I really love the idea, like the, the works that I'm working on now, I'm working on Supergirl with Joelle Jones and um, Hulk with Nico Leon, who are both just incredible artists and I get really excited when we start working and with the insight that other people bring and also the editors that I work with in comics and in prose, I think that there's always that moment where someone sees something that you didn't see, and you realize that like, in those conversations, it's an exciting moment where you realize that that insight is going to make what you do better. And I, I just love that. Yeah, you've moved from groups to duets, which is quite interesting. Um, George, I, I know, uh, because we brought you here about a year ago, that uh, you have worked on collaborative projects like Beatrice Chansey, which was a verse play that portrays slavery in 19th century Nova Scotia, uh, but you've also done a uh, libretto for Trudeau Long March. Uh, and these are only two works that involve um, collect collective work with another individual, but now that you're the Canadian Parliamentary Poet Laureate, I imagine collaboration is something that that you have to deal with a lot. I was wondering if you could speak to collaboration in your, in your work. Uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, it's great to be back in London. Uh, I'll just say that uh, I don't mind collaborating. Uh, and in this new role, I don't mind collaborating either, uh, except I always have to be nonpartisan. And, and, uh, uh, and I really try to, to speak to that and, and uh, not say anything that could get, to get me in trouble or that could be embarrassing for Parliament. But on that note, I do want to read this poem, uh, which is about Jean Chrétien. And uh, partly because of the fact I saw him last week, and he gave a great speech at uh, Montebello, Quebec, last Friday night, uh, last Thursday night to be precise. Anyway, Jean Chrétien, it's in two parts, Revised Standard Version uh, is the title of the first part. So here it is, and I hope that everybody here, or most of you, will remember him. Here it is. A Frankenstein masked, meeching elfish ghoul, skulking in a graveyard of prime ministers, admiring how they begged elections, or dreading how they later got sacked, those lumberjacks hulking in silk suits, those attorneys awkward in buckskins, defining the country as one more strip mine after one more lucrative deforestation, all Chrétien ever wanted was to join this gothic junkyard of shadow-pond statues, clutching the criminal code in one hand, a golf club in the other, while sloshing out rhetoric that was martinis and pablum drizzled over cooing ministers. Slick, he slipped through cracks and bad news and popped up gleaming like a televangelist while acting Laurier with an alley-oop squint Le Petit Gar orating Say de la Bullshit, his speech spitting a pepper spray clarity. His Canada was can't and cannot, a parliament of lepers and peons, a politics of nothing doing, because doing nothing means nothing's wrong. He was the perfect mime of a prime minister, choosing to ape the mannerisms of the dead, to shuffle zombie-like into history through a labyrinth of funhouse mirrors stuttering his forged, misshapen greatness. Part two. <laughs> he was depressive, swinish, foolish, garrulous, wrathful, calculating, tricky, ornery, arrogant, 
execrable, difficult, vengeful, professional, sly, narrow, bullheaded, deft, lawyerly, egotistical, despicable, vital, and he was all of these things every single day of every single election year. <laughs> then he got worse. <laughs> That's Thank wonderful. You, Thank you, everybody. I'm going to return to that because that actually is a question that I want to ask you is about uh, the, the, the mix of nonpartisan and, and your poem is just a perfect capture. I want to make a link back to Robert, though, uh, because uh, you also are a uh, librettist. You've written a libretto for uh, something that's coming up. And I want to give a brief description of what's taking place because right now we're marking a series of 100th anniversaries for the events of World War I, the Great War, including the recent 100th anniversary of Beaumont Hamel during the Battle of the Somme on the 1st of July, as well as the upcoming 100th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge coming up in April of 2017, an engagement that sparked Brigadier General Alexander Ross to say of the Canadian contribution, in those few minutes I watched the birth of a nation. World War I also catalyzed a new national consciousness for the arts from the creation of a stunning uh, and moving collection of wartime paintings through the Canadian War Memorials Fund, which is now hanging in the Canadian War Museum if you've had a chance to see it in Ottawa. And many of them uh, include Group of Seven paintings as well, but also in the literary arts. And I want to ask uh, uh, Robert, you recently wrote the libretto for an opera called Ours, which is set around the events of the Newfoundland Regiment's involvement in the Battle of the Somme at Beaumont Hamel. Many in Canada don't know the profound significance of this event for Newfoundland, its complexity, its trauma. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little about this event and how you got involved in, in opera. That, that fascinates me too. Sure. Um, uh, Beaumont Hamel, 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 depending on where you are in the world. Newfoundlanders call it Beaumont Hamel. We always uh, anglicize everything to formal degrees. Um, it's a small town. Um, on the Somme, uh, and in Ju on July 1st, so Canada Day, now in Newfoundland, uh, is also Memorial Day. Um, previously to joining Canada, it was mem only Memorial Day in Newfoundland. On July 1st, 1916, um, the Newfoundland Regiment went up and over the top at a, I will spare you all the details, but a kind of disastrously, disastrously plotted uh, affront on the uh, Germans' uh, first day of the Battle of the Somme. And, 806 Newfoundlanders went over the top and 68 entered the roll call the next day. The rest were either killed, wounded, or missing. And so it um, you literally cannot find a town in Newfoundland that was not affected by a, a loss or a death. Uh, and it really shaped the identity of the country. And, and, and World War I uh, left the country with a significant uh, overwhelming debt. And we were one of the few countries, and I don't know the actual history here, we we're one of the few countries that actually ended up paying off our war debt, which sunk our, our, our nation. Uh, and by 1933, we had lost nationhood, gone into receivership, essentially, with Britain, and then, of course, uh, joining Canada in 1949. So uh, the loss of nationhood in Newfoundland is very, very tied up emotionally with Beaumont Hamill and what actually happened there. Um, I, I think, like most every artist in Newfoundland, I've, I've wrestled with the idea of Beaumont Hamill as a, a pacifist. I've wrestled with the idea of doing work about war. I've, and... and um, I've been wanting to write about it for many, many years, and I knew that uh, coming at it, I wanted to look at um, it, the lasting effect of the battle. I wanted to look at the scar as opposed to retelling the story of the battle itself. I felt like that had been done to death in many other forms. Uh, and so um, I put that on hold because I didn't quite know what to do, and then it, it was quite amazing how this whole thing came together because a friend of mine gave me a book that was newly published in 2008 called Soldier Priest. And Newfoundland has a, I, I'm sure elsewhere in the country is the same, but in Newfoundland you certainly can see going to any store there's like racks and racks and racks of local books. There's tons of publishers. It seems anyone that actually can get together to write a book will get it published locally in Newfoundland, including myself. I just wrote a book of short stories. Um, <laughs> Uh, they'll publish anything. Uh, so this book came out. It was called Soldier Priest. And a friend of mine gave it to me. And, and by that point, I developed a bit of a reputation for telling true stories on stage. And he said, you should write a play about this guy. And so, yeah, yeah, I'll read it. You know. And So I put it on my shelf. And then I got a, a phone call out of the blue from uh, Cheryl Hickman at Opera in the Avalon. And they had commissioned John Astacio, which is one of our best opera composers in the country, uh, to create uh, a piece about Beaumont Hamill for the 100th anniversary, which was just this last summer. Uh, and John's usual uh, librettist had to back out of the project because he was ill. And so they were looking for someone else. And she said, do you have an idea? Can you pitch something by the end of the week? <laughs> and so I, in a panic, went to the book and gra 
grabbed this book and read it, and immediately, as soon as I finished the book, I knew I had the story. The, the story is, um, the opera is about um, the former um, padre to the regiment. His name was Sir Thomas, um, Thomas Nangle. He was um, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Nangle. And he joined the regiment just after the battle. So he wanted to go at the beginning of the war, but they wouldn't let anyone go. They sent a British chaplain instead. Then after the destruction of Beaumont Hamill, they said the Newfoundlanders need their own chaplain, so they sent him. He essentially saw out the rest of the war with the regiment. But his real work started after the war was over. Uh, he um, pretty much by himself um, established the will and the money to go back to uh, France and Belgium, purchased all of the significant uh, pieces of land where the Newfoundlanders had fought and died, including Beaumont Hamill. He negotiated personally with 250 landowners in France to buy that piece of land and established memorial parks, which are now part of Veterans Affairs. It still exists over there. It's now under the Canadian banner. And he did all that, and uh, as soon as he finished all that, of course, that work also involved going back and exhuming the bodies that were literally left in ditches, uh, identifying them, many men that he actually knew personally, and reburying them in these parks. And as soon as that work was over, as soon as he had launched the uh, National War Memorial in downtown St. John's, he went to the Archdiocese in St. John's and quit the priesthood. And as a result of that, he ended up moving to Rhodesia. Didn't see that coming. He moves to Rhodesia, where he marries and has four children and lives the rest of his life and never returns to Newfoundland. And his name is virtually unknown in Newfoundland. It's becoming, I'm actually going to a ceremony on Tuesday Day where the plaque will finally be revealed of him being designated a person of historical significance, which has been attempted for many, many years. But he's essentially been wiped off the books, uh, many people proclaim, because he left the priesthood and because of that stain on his character uh, and the power of the church in Newfoundland, he was essentially virtually unknown un until recently, until this opera and until the push to have him recognized as a person of historical significance. So that's what the opera's about. It was an incredible experience working with John Astacio. Um, yeah, it just premiered in July, and we're hoping that it will eventually make its way up here somewhere. That's a wonderful description. And what we just heard was a, just an incredible capture of a remarkably complex and moving moment in Canadian history. Um, it connects with uh, Jennifer as well. So Beaumont Hamel, or Beaumont Hamel, depending on where you are in Canada, uh, Hamel. Is, is, as you say, it's part of it's Canadian soil. We, we purchased that land. Uh, we have one more monument that's like that, and it just so happens that Jennifer was a guide at the Vimy War Memorial when you wow. were a teenager, before you went to graduate school. Yeah, before before I you... was, it was between my first and second year at, at King's, and I, uh, I got the slot, they, they slot the students in um, for typically it's two month sessions, and mine was in, uh, in April before exams had been written. And I remember getting word that I'd been picked for one of the guide positions and then running uh, from professor to professor to, to beg them to let me take the exams early. And I would, it, I would you know, uh, promise the, the, the soul of my firstborn if, if, you know, if I were to, to tell anyone what was on the exam. And they were all kind enough to let me write the exams early so I could leave a month early. And so I was there in the summer, or the spring to the summer of 1989. I was 19 years old, I arrived there um, fresh from my first year at university, and I knew everything there was to know about the war. I was pretty certain of that. Um, and that lasted about a day. Uh, and then the first of the veterans of the Great War came to the park, and I was able to shake their hands and to walk behind them as they showed me around this place uh, that is so sacred and terrible at the same time. And um, it, it's some, I still get choked up thinking about it because every last one of those men is dead. Uh, the last known veteran of the Great War uh, died when I was finishing um, work on Somewhere in France. Um, and her name, it was a woman, actually. It was a, her name was Florence Green. And she was uh, in one of the auxiliary services in, in Britain and was very chuffed when somebody did some digging and discovered that she was the actual last veteran on the planet. Uh, she, her last two years were in a, just a glow of celebrity and, and really and she just loved giving interviews and she, you can see them online, she was a very entertaining lady. But the, the knowledge that all of, all of that is gone, the first-hand knowledge of this war um, and the, the crucible uh, that it made of the 20th century um, that's gone, and so in some ways, I, it, people say, well, where did you get the idea to write about the Great War? Well, it began there. It, it, to a certain degree, it began with my father 
and when I was 16, handing me the collected works of Wilfred Owen, which is the best possible time to read the collected works of Wilfred Owen because I was at my most romantic, and I loved him. I love him still to my to the depth of my soul. I love Wilfred Owen, and um, and that from then on, I did have an interest, but it was only by standing there and talking to these men, listening, listening to them. It's a hard thing to do to listen when you're 19. You have so many things to say, and you're, you're not really good at, at shutting your mouth and opening your ears, and I learned that summer. But I think what it did is it, it, it sowed the seeds of interest that someday I felt there was a story I had to tell about the Great War. Um, it took me 25 years to do it, but I, I got there in the end. Wonderful. Um, I have a question, too, that I want to stitch together with uh, George and, and Mariko. I'm going to start with George. Um, I remember, I don't know if you remember when we first met, it was actually the BAMP Center, and uh, we were in a session, it was on uh, a big, ambitious session, and you were a contributor on it, to, to talk about the state of the arts in Canada at the time, and you had, uh, I had asked you a question about the place of politics and the arts, and you gave this very stirring uh, response on the unsurpassable place of politics and the arts from the decisions that we make in programming to the stories that we tell to the works that we choose to canonize. And I've heard you make remarks lately that resonate with that remark too in terms of your poet laureate position, which is interesting because of the nonpartisan part and the poem that you just read, which is quite fascinating. One of the, the guiding ideas of the Words Festival is the conviction that literary imagination has an important role not only to play in the arts, but also in the promotion of social justice and engaged citizenship in London, Canada, and beyond. Um, and you've recently spoken very compellingly on representing stories in Canada um, that represent the diversity of Canada, but also democratize the experience of poetry, so that poetry is an experience that everyone can have. And I was wondering if you could speak to uh, those two points, the diversity of representation uh, of the stories that we need to tell, and also uh, why we need to have a more democratic idea of poetry. Well, uh, thank you, Josh. Uh, I'll just say very quickly that poetry is automatically democratic, because all of us come to some notion of poetry whether we pick up a Hallmark card, no matter how disreputable that may seem to some ears, or uh, bother to uh, sing uh, alone or with somebody else, uh, an Ian Tyson song like Four Strong Winds or uh, Leonard Cohen's song, uh, So Long, Mary Ann, or a Bob Dylan's song, uh, Positively Fourth Street comes to mind suddenly, or Just Like Tom Thumb's Blues, uh, and, and, or Joni Mitchell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the reason why, or Gord Downey song, uh, I think the reason why those uh, tunes resonate so much with us is because they are speaking to profound emotions, profound feelings, uh, that we need sung words, or sometimes spoken words, sermonic words, like Psalm 23, for instance, uh, to enable us to really be able to uh, produce the uh, appropriate emotion uh, you know, uh, that is supported uh, or, or that is demanded by those words. Uh, so this is a, a long way of saying that, uh, as usual, and i got to say, as usual, reports of the death of poetry are always exaggerated. And eulogies for the death of poetry are always premature. It's never going to die. It's always going to be with us because every single one of us, sooner or later, is going to want to have a poem uh, to express our deepest, innermost feelings in the face of what makes us human, uh, which is in, uh, the articulate uh, expression of emotion. Uh, uh, and, and again, about all the eternal verities, love, death, aging, uh, childbirth, uh, raising children, uh, and watching the seasons change, uh, all of the above, uh, dealing with oppression, dealing with tyranny, uh, fighting for democracy, fighting for liberation, fighting for liberty. Uh, all of these are perennial notions of poetry. So it can never, never, never disappear or die or, or vanish. It can simply sometimes go underground and sometimes go in disguise. Uh, but I'm going to uh, read very quickly a very short poem uh, to flesh out these ideas. And, 
And uh, it's a love poem, and it's not a poem by me. It's a poem by Alexander Pushkin, uh, whose name has always, already been invoked tonight, the great Russian poet, who, by the way, never hesitated to say that he was black, always celebrated his African ancestry, uh, and so on. So this is a poem actually by him. The title is, I Loved You Once. Uh, and I'll just say, it's a translation uh, from Pushkin, but I will confess, I don't know any Russian. Uh, so my translation is a rewriting of somebody's English version, which I didn't like very much. Uh, and I thought that Pushkin, being a passionate guy who died in a duel, for crying out loud, the dude died in a duel, he's passionate. He's passionate, defending uh, the honor of his wife for crying out loud. You can't have a dull poem uh, representing Pushkin. So I decided to rewrite it with Nova Scotian passion. So, and it rhymes too, by the way, and it's very short. Uh, I loved you once. I loved you once, thus tranquility quails. Rabbit love harries my flesh and frame. But darling, let no cyclone havoc your sails. For though I'm hurting, I bear you no blame. I loved you recklessly in pure surrender, welcome sorrows, jealousies, black and blue. A love as intense and intent and tender. God let another lover Render you. It's beautiful. To connect and, and to, to just... Oh, I have to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> to what? link in. Your, your new young adult novel, Saving Montgomery Soul, presents a young person who has two moms, attends a school where there's bullying and homophobia, You've described how the book presents different strategies for resisting discrimination, oppression, through the characters Monty, Thomas, and Naoki, or uh, Naoki. Naoki, that's it. Uh, your work is directly confronting some of the most challenging issues in Canada and the United States around discrimination. How important is it for you as, as a writer, whether of young adult fiction, graphic novels, theater, um, performance art, performance to be? Art to be engaged with these issues in your work? I mean, I, I, I don't try to, it's not so much that I think that I want to engage the issues as I try to imagine the characters and, uh, and sort of just go where, I mean, it's gonna sound so hippie, but you just kind of try to go where that character goes. Um, when I first came up with the idea of this girl who's confronting this evangelical preacher, I mean, that obviously comes from like, this place that I, like every time I see like a super right wing video where they're talking about, you know, you know, transgender people in bathrooms or whatever, I feel it's like a, it's a really, you know, physical feeling. Like I feel really assaulted whenever I, whenever I see those videos. And I try to imagine that as what, what that would feel like for a teenager once I sort of realized that was the story. Um, and so in that particular case, I sort of thought of the sort of different ways, like, you know, I was somebody who was really angry. Like I would respond, I was a delight as a child and I would respond to anger with anger. Um, but I also liked the idea of sort of, because it's YA and you can kind of show a sort of a spectrum of reactions, I wanted to have one character who basically sort of like Thomas sort of projects himself forward as an adult, sort of rises above, maybe artificially rises above the things that are really upsetting to him. And then I tried to have this character who's the character of Naoki who is kind of the ideal, like someone who can just admit how something makes her feel and sort of be with that instead of you know reacting to it as though it's like an actual like physical jab. Um, but it's interesting because I think at the same time, there's definitely times when I do include stuff like that, but there's also times like, I think especially when you're a queer person and you're writing about queer characters, I don't always want to have to have them go through that stuff. And I definitely sometimes, you know, in other works have kind of projected a more ideal world where that doesn't happen. And I think it's kind of interesting sometimes to, you know, it feels weird to sort of imagine a world where it's just entirely okay to be gay and no one ever is going to give you any kind of hassle and it's super awesome. I mean, it is super awesome, but like externally dealing with other people, have it be super awesome. 
Um, but it's kind of an exercise, and I try to make I try to make it not so much that I'm writing to the issue as I'm writing sort of different lives as I, as I kind of know and imagine them. Absolutely. And in light of uh, what's going to happen next week, we need all of the, the, the critical voices that we can and the, celebrating the power and the life of words. We created this festival for every one of you in this audience. We created this festival for London. We created this festival for Southwestern Ontario. I want you all to come back tomorrow and Saturday to see each of these fine artists talk about their work and others talk about their work. Please come downstairs. There's books available. Grab a drink. Meet other people. Chat with our artists, who I'm sure would be okay to uh, sign a book or two and, and chat with you as well. We have some other artists that are on our list as well that are in the crowd that might be, you might be able to identify as well. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Please come back to the festival to see what we've put on. It's a dynamic lineup of speakers. And thank our wonderful panel of artists. Thank you. Thank you, Josh.